So, a few weeks ago, we all took a pretty difficult test. After failing it, I was subsequently informed that there was still more to this class. Now, I would be doing a final project, one worth a rather substantial chunk of my grade. So I started writing this script. Now, I can't code Java, but I can write scripts, and in my humble opinion, I've really knocked it out of the park with this one. So without further ado, I present to you a brief history of computer science, I guess. In the beginning, there was nothing. Well, not really, but the true lack of nothing was the kicker. The fact that nothing was never nowhere wasn't the hard part, but it certainly complicated things. Probably. But then, from that icy embrace of the chilling void, sprung forth life. From bacteria to amoeba to algae to fish to alligators to apes and right here, about 55 million years ago, we had the first monkeys on Earth. Then some time passes, then some more time passes, and then they started walking on two legs, grew a little less hair, sharpened rocks to make tools, discovered fire, started planting seeds for food to eat in the winter, making tools out of bronze instead of rock, built homes, started families, spoke an understandable, comprehensible language, started communities that spread out even further, and bang, here we are. So how do we get to computers from here? Well, it's a well-known fact that humans don't like to think. In fact, we'll expend massive amounts of energy and resources just to think a little less. Case in point being, the astrolabe. The idea behind these early analog computers is that of preserving a ratio found in nature. For example, a gear that makes a full revolution once every 24 hours might just make a great tool for keeping track of time, right? If you can quantify things that happen naturally while keeping them in the ratio in which they occur, you have yourself an analog computer. Now, many of these early computers were quite simple and didn't really punch much above their weight. For example, the astrolabe that I had mentioned earlier was a pretty popular tool in the early 1000s, as it used two needles locked in a ratio together with a disk face of celestial bodies behind them to accurately predict the stars in the night sky, if you give it the season. They originated in the early Persian Empire as both an accurate navigational tool and as a trusted way of timing Ramadan. Such was their usefulness, nearly every early culture either made their own equivalent or just adopted the Persian design for maritime navigation. Though these early tools were marvels of their time, today they prove difficult to use without intimate knowledge of their inner workings. But it only makes sense that people would apply the same concept to something much more complex, with many more moving parts, right? So let's see what they did next. Transition slide. Transition slide. Hoo-wee, that was a long section. Well, from now on, things are going to get a little more technical, though, I promise, my humor won't let up. <clears throat> Anyways, early mechano-analog computers are incredible. If we stretch the definition a bit, the first mechanical calculating device is theorized to have been created in 1623, and functioned mostly as a mechanical mashup of an abacus and a slide rule. Even so, the technology developed very quickly, and soon became the de facto standard in mathematics for anyone with a budget to match. Though they started off as fancy counting machines, newer models started adding amazing features like subtracting numbers. Oh, and less impressive stuff like division and multiplication and percentages and stuff. Easily the most famous of this category of integer method devices is the Curta calculator in the early 1930s, being a soda can sized fully functional mechanical calculator that could even handle exponents. And yes, you still had to crank a little handle while it calculated. Honestly though, this early stage of computing was incredibly influential, and really goes to show how much we do just to save a little time crunching numbers. They even inspired the typewriter. Insert transition sound effect here. Insert transition sound effect here. Oh, the punch card. The first easily transportable way of storing computer data, these little slips of paper represented a revolution in the way we handled the growth of computing technologies. With them came actual programming, genuine instructions for the computer to follow when it came to handling input data from the user. They also brought the first quasi-form of standardization, so most programs could run on most computers. Punch cards have been around for a bit over a century now, as the first computational device to use them for input was made in the late 1800s for counting the United States' census data. They rapidly became the standard for computers in business and industrial use due to their near-infinite programmability as long as you didn't drop a stack of them, of course. 
the proper order was required for the computer to do anything. I mean, you can't just mix around your lines of code, right? And speaking of programming, these megaluminum monsters ran on Fortran, COBOL, or Assembly, if you really wanted to suffer. This partial jump from analog to digital computing was huge, but even though the information was still represented by a physical constant, making it analog, it used many digital processes to decode and apply this data, which led to some scrutiny. Computer experts of the time noticed that the digital components weren't really being strained much, which set them thinking. What would the speed be like if not for this analog bottleneck? How do you store the most basic form of data, a boolean, in a way that gives an electronic device full control over its state without needing any influence through an external party? Well, a transistor might work. To put it simply, a transistor is like a light switch. It can be on or off. Then, just as a space on a punch card represents a 1 or a 0 by being punched or not, we can assign that same 1 or 0 to the state of the transistor. Off is a 0 and on is a 1. This method allows the computer itself to directly correlate where files are and how much data they represent, thus inventing the file system. Uh, it also eliminates the analog bottleneck that we had just touched upon earlier, as now manipulation of data is purely a digital process. Well, now that that data is digital, how do we transport it? Well, why not a thin sheet of transistors with some contacts on the end that you could stick into the computer? Yeah, that would work, uh, but we didn't invent that yet. SSDs would only really be a thing in a few decades. Uh, instead, we write it on a really thin disk. Enclose the disk in thin plastic too, and that should work, but uh, it's not very structurally stable. In fact, it's kind of wobbly? Wavy? Hmm. I sure wonder what we'll call these disks made out of a floppy material. <gasps> Could it be? Is this a transition slide? Oh goodness, oh heavens me. Oh wow, haven't seen one of these in a long time. Oh, the early 80s. Back when cocaine was less illegal, fashion choices were directly influenced by that, and France still used the guillotine. You'll often hear many adults reminiscing about this time period, as it's before they grew up and before their hair turned gray. Sorry, Mr. Yost. <laughs> anyway, computers, yeah. So this is when computers really started exploding into the mainstream. Sure, most white-collar snooty office people already used computers for work, but this was a time when they also gained popularity in the average American household. Computing staples like the Apple II, IBM 5150, and Trash, or TRS-80, really cemented their place in history, kind of like Madonna getting banned by MTV. Which mattered? I think we cared about that. Anyways, this is the time period which any computer person over 40 thinks was amazing. Floppy disks also entirely replaced cassette tapes for storage, because although it's true that they hold only like one one hundredth of the data, they were also a lot faster in retrieving that data. But I called this chapter the gold in years, specifically because of how much more popular it started to become to integrate gold into computer chips. Yes, I started that sentence with a preposition. If that bothers you, I'm sure the friends you think you have, you actually don't. <clears throat> but anyways, don't get me wrong. A lot of circuits and computers were already gold-coded, but as the practice became the standard, the speed difference in computers that really leaned into the gold process became a lot more noticeable. And just like that, this section's over. Wow, the 80s sure did pass by quickly. Just like they did back then, huh? Okay, we're gonna be skipping ahead a little here. I don't think many people will mind, as forgetting that the 90s existed is a pretty popular thing to do anyways. So, to make it short and quick, Floppy disks got a lot smaller, and less floppy, hard drives grew more popular in general, every computer switched from DOS to Windows, except for the airline and banking industries, which didn't switch until... uh... But yeah, the whole 90s flew by. When the 2000s finally came around, we got over the whole Y2K thing, and computers got a lot clearer. Besides looking like the hottest new trend in prison tech, everybody loved their wonky form factors and colored transparent plastic. I can't really see why we thought this was acceptable at all, but hey, it's not up to me to judge people of the past, unless they're wrong, like they were here. Besides marvelous form factors, the remnants of the dot-com bubble pushed manufacturers into cramming tech into the weirdest things. From toothbrushes to books to cigarettes to water bottles, everything that you own could now be put on charge. Facebook was the hip place to be, as MySpace was now a thing of the past. Could you imagine that? But what actually changed? Well, the very first modern AIs were being developed, with basic goals of telling apart cats from dogs and piloting missiles at Middle Eastern buildings. The CRT was finally dethroned in the minds and hearts of the people, with most switching to LCD flat screens at the time. 
Though a lot of innovation truly did happen, it mostly feels like an extension of the ideas laid decades ago, not anything that I would call truly new or innovative. It was a perfection, not a competition, and people could tell. But where does that leave us now? Modern day. Ugh, I'm almost through with this wretched script and my can of sugar-free Monster Zero brand energy drink is starting to taste pretty stale, so let's just get this over with. Um, AI is a big thing now. I touched on it briefly during the last segment, but it has evolved from a cute gimmick to a true field of study with large innovations happening all the time. Cloud computing is really helping in that area, as many AI training programs take more computing power to run than a Colombian Bitcoin farm. AI is really only a few decades away from making our current society into a Black Mirror episode, so make sure you pick this as your major. Yes, you specifically. I'm telling you to pick this as your major because you'll make lots of money. Another thing of note, our current computer chips are so advanced they're now weak to radiation. I'm sure some of you already know about the quantum bit flip problem, but for those who are unaware, listen up. So do you remember how a transistor is a way that we store a one or a zero digitally? Well, the more transistors a computer has, the faster it is. We can't have computers the size of rooms anymore though, so instead we focus on making the transistors smaller so we can cram more of them into the same amount of space. Well, we're so good at making them smaller that they're now about 12 atoms big. Impressive, sure, but now they're extremely receptive to radiation, which if it hits the transistor can directly flip a 1 to a 0. It's not a big deal until that bit flip happens in the navigation systems of a China Airlines Airbus A300, which crash into a hillside due to the change. Yeah. So while we relax in our peaceful post-technological life, remember this. There will always be problems, no matter how advanced we get, and they'll really only get ever addressed after they kill you. Thanks for watching!